Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this series of webinars. We are focusing on publishing and research communications. This is the fifth um, webinar that we are having now. So thank you for joining us. I must say good morning to those who are in the Western Hemisphere and good afternoon to us in this region and those in the Eastern region. So we are glad to have you so many joining on this webinar. And again, thanks to the colleagues that are working on Research for Life that they've put together this series. The focus for this webinar is really focusing on how to increase your chances of success as far as getting published is concerned. So to start us, um, we would like to look at the uh, Mentimeter that has been set up to hear from you the kind of uh, work that you have done as far as publishing is concerned. On the board, you will see the Mentimeter code that you can use to log in. And there are a couple of questions that you need to answer. So I'll let my colleague Messi uh, run that, and then we can look at the results before we start the first session. You're yeah, welcome, Messi. Could you stop sharing screen so I can take control for a second? There we go. And if you're just okay, joining- let's give it another minute so that the others can find their way to the Mentimeter platform. If you're just joining, you can see the login details at the top of the screen there, and you need to put in that um, code when you log in. I'm glad more of you are figuring out how to do that. And the numbers are increasing. Okay, we'll give it another five seconds on this question. So for those who are just joining us now, we, we have put in on the Mentimeter a question. We actually have a couple of questions on that. And what you can see on top there is the code for this, for this session. So when you log in on menti.com, you'll be able to log in with that code. All right, this is great. So many of you have published, um, quite a number haven't published, but um, we will be able to go through on the aspects of how best you can go about it to get published. So do not lose hope, that's the point of this session. Do we want to go to the next uh, question? Thank you. So we want to try and establish um, your discipline and see today whom we have in this session. 
I can see already we've got colleagues from medicine and health. Colleagues from biological sciences, social sciences, quite a number actually. It's a nice spread. Yes, great. Information and computer science as well. Okay, quite a number in the physical sciences and engineering. Give it a couple of more seconds. Thank you very much. All right, this is great. Um, over to you, Messi. Thank you, Gretchen. Welcome everyone. Let me just share, reshare my screen. Okay. All right. So Gretchen has already introduced our topic for today. So uh, this is the fifth part of a six part webinar series on research publishing and research communications. So like uh, so far we, had, we have had four of the webinars and this is the fifth one. And in this webinar, we are going to focus on getting published and how to increase your chances of success in getting published. Because we often find researchers complaining that uh, my paper has been rejected and so forth and so forth. So in this webinar, we are going to try and help you to deal with that. So we are going to talk about uh, how to navigate the different steps and process for dissemination of your research, uh, discover how to choose the best journal for your work, understand how to prepare and submit a manuscript for publication, and you are also to going to gain an understanding about the peer review process and learn how to respond to peer review comments. Uh, uh, we are going to briefly look at uh, the webinar, the six part webinar series as a whole. Then we are going to move into our presentations and then we are going to get into the question and answer at the end of the, pre of the presentations. Then we are going to have a wrap up. So this webinar series is structured along a simple research life cycle model by those authors that are on the board. So they, they, the life cycle consists of five steps, which is idea development, funding, proposal, conducting the research and disseminating the research findings. So like I indicated before we have had uh, four webinars before. The first webinar was an introduction to the webinar series, highlighting the initial steps of research, search and access literature and formulating the research question. Webinar two was on open science uh, from open access to open research, what it is all about. And webinar three was on writing winning grant proposal uh, to get your research successfully funded and webinar four focused on understanding publishing ethics. So if you missed any of these previous webinars, uh, like uh, the recordings are available on the Research for Life website. So you can just go on the link that is on the board so that you can actually access the webinars. We are going to give you the link to the webinar in the last uh, slide for this presentation, to the webinar recordings in the last part or uh, last slide of this presentation. But if you just go on Google and you type Research for Life webinars, you'll be taken to a page where you can actually find all the webinars that have been delivered in Research for Life. So now we are on webinar five on getting published 
uh, how to increase your chances of success. Then the last and final webinar is going to be run from on the 20th of July, and it is going to focus on increasing impact of your research. Okay, so this uh, this project, the way the PRC webinar series, is a collaboration amongst uh, multiple Research for Life partners, which include uh, the publishers, Research for Life itself, Itoka, and many other uh, partners uh, that are working with Research for Life. And our target audience are uh, participants or Research for Life users from the Research for Life eligible countries. And like I indicated before, the recordings for these webinars are available on uh, the Research for Life uh, website. And we will also discuss challenges facing LMICs and Research for Life users in this webinar series. So today we are going to present as three presenters. So the first presenter is Victoria Babit, who is the Director in, of Research and Development and Outreach at Taylor and Francis. Then Gretchen Chimaza, Gretchen Chimaza is the Executive Director of ITOKA and the recently sworn in chair for the Research for Life Executive, Executive Council. And myself, Messi Moyo, uh, I am a Senior Program Officer here at ITOKA. Okay, so this, uh, this uh, presentation is broken down into three parts. So the first part is on choosing a journal. Then the second part is on preparing a manuscript. Then the third part is on a uh, submission. And the fourth and final part is on peer review. So I am going to start with the first part on choosing a journal. Then I will hand over to Gretchen to to talk you to take you through preparation of a manuscript then uh, victoria will take you through submission and the peer review process we have already completed uh, completed this menti so let's uh, move on to the first part of the session which is choosing a publishing venue how do you choose a publisher uh, like uh, researchers often struggle on like, uh, like because you want to publish. So what is my first point of call? Who am I going to conduct? Who am I going to publish with? So there are questions that you need to ask yourself as a researcher when you want to publish. So first of all, obviously you are publishing for a certain type of audiences because the, pers uh, the purpose of disseminating research findings is that those research findings are get out there to the other researchers. So you need to think about who your audience is and does your article arouse interest globally, regional, regionally or locally so that you can identify if like uh, the, the interest is locally, you might need to identify local publications that you can publish in. Then you ask yourself, what is the subject matter of my article? So take for example, uh, my article is on uh, information literacy then I'm going to uh, submit my manuscript to a journal that is publishing articles in mathematics. The possibility of my article being rejected is quite high. So ask yourself these questions before you can actually consider which journal to publish. So issues to consider about journals. You need to take into consideration the type of article you would like to publish. Is it a full length article, a letter or a review? Because there are different types of journals that are on the market. There are some journals that just publish reviews and some they publish full, full, full length articles. So this is one aspect that you also need to consider. You can also check the references in your article like when you are doing your literature review, uh, like you will find some, uh, some uh, in, in interesting articles that you are referring to when you are writing your publication. At the list or at the reference list, you can actually find uh, like uh, the journals that are the authors that published before you in that specific discipline published in. So that can also give you a guidance on which journals to, uh, to, to target. Then you also need to read 
the journal's aims and scope, uh, which is usually found on the journal homepage, and check if the article fits, your article fits within the aims and scope of the journal. If it is not fitting and you feel that you can actually adjust your article to fit within that scope, then you can adjust your article accordingly. Some journals specify the type of the research that they do not publish. So please make sure that you refer to that page. Uh, then you also need to check if the journals is, pu is published similar work uh, like yours before, the quality of the work, the scope and so forth and so forth. Then you can read and download the journal's guidelines to authors. Uh, it is important to note word count because usually they stipulate like the number of words that are acceptable. They also stipulate the format, the font, and so forth and so forth. So that is uh, more like your plan when you are actually writing your article. Uh, like, and there are also some journals that are by invitation only. So if you uh, submit your article to a journal that is in, by invitation only, your chances of rejection are pretty high. So check that before you can actually submit an article. Then you can also check your uh, the journal's performance review and publication timelines, submit your paper to only one journal at a time. If it, it is then rejected, then you can approach uh, the second journal. If you choose to publish open access, remember that uh, most journals explain their open access options on the, on the journal homepage. Consider the metric and journal uh, of, for the journals, which is known as the journal impact factor, which is also found on the journal's homepage. So like for a guideline of uh, like, if you want to publish in an open access journal, we actually encourage you to actually consult the director of open access journals, because like we have received a like request from you, some research for life users asking, how can I be published in research for life? And we usually encourage them to go the director of open access journals route because the director of open access journals are indexed in research for life. So if you publish in a journal that is under the director of open access, your article will actually actually be on research for life. So like uh, this is just in um, uh, like a screenshot to show you the impact factor, which is it is a homepage for a journal and it is showing you the impact factor, which is one of the metric that you can actually use to assess if a journal is a good journal. So like uh, there are uh, many journal publishers, they actually provide you with resources that you can use to find journals to publish in. I know that uh, like Elsef here, they've got uh, like the journal finder, but please take note that uh, like, if you like use these resources, take for example, like the, the, the journal finder from Elsef here, like, so you add uh, this, uh, these resources, you actually add your topic, then you actually add a snippet of your abstract so that, and they will list a number of journals that are in line with that, uh, with your title and your abstract, but they only indexed journals that they are publishing as Elsevier. So please take note of that. So we have got uh, these resources like SciDevNet. Uh, we are going to share this, uh, pre these presentations and the recording. So you can actually revisit these resources at a later stage. I'm not going to go through them uh, in detail because of time. So we also have uh, the journal author uh, name estimator, which is called uh, in, uh, abbreviated as Jane. We also have the journal selector, English editing for scientists. Uh, like and so forth and so forth. So the list is uh, is not exhaustive. You can actually find a lot of resources that you can use online. So moving on to the second part of my presentation on open access. So what is open access? Open access is making content freely available online to read, meaning your manuscript can be read by anyone uh, anywhere. Uh, 
like uh, open access um, uh, intends to make content reusable by third parties with little or no restrictions. And an example of an open access portal is the director of open access journals that I referred to earlier. So like obviously when you are publishing in a journal, in an open access journal, you are publishing through what is called gold open access. They, and there are full online uh, open access journals and there are also hybrid open access journals. So what are full open access journals? These are journals that publish all content open access. Uh, they are funded by article or processing charges, sponsorship and institutional agreement. And you can also publish your article in a hybrid open access journals. And what is a hybrid open access journal? This is a subscription funded uh, journal that offer the option of open access. Open access costs are funded by article processing charges and are or under an agreement with an institution. So these are the options that are available. And we also have waivers. Most of us, most of, uh, of the users coming from Research for Life uh, uh, eligible countries, uh, like they qualify for waivers, waivers, from the, like, so if you want to publish with most journals, I'm sure most of you who have published, you know that uh, like these publishers, they charge you an article processing charge. So there are waivers that are available for users or authors that are coming from developing countries. So you should actually check to see if you qualify for that waiver before you can actually pay because some of the journals, they are quite, costly to publish with them. So Research for Life has actually put up a page on best practices for a PC waiver, waivers which are available there. And they've also put a page with links to publisher APC, APC waiver policies, which is uploaded, uh, uh, like updated once a year. So you can actually con uh, consult Research for Life website for that information about waivers. And also we have got information about waivers from our colleague that is presenting with us from Taylor and Francis, uh, uh, Victoria. So you can, in, you can access the waivers for Taylor and Francis through that link. Then uh, like uh, when you are publishing with, uh, with an open access journal, you need to take care to take note that open access content is, uh, is protected by what is called creative common licenses. So like some of us, we just see like uh, the CC and the picture or uh, the symbol of the human being and you don't know what it means. So CC means creative common license that a symbol of a human being means by it stands it means that others must acknowledge you when they are reusing your work then nc it means others can only reuse your non uh, your work for non commercial purposes then nd it means others cannot amend your work then sa it means the work must be shared under the same license as the original or, or of the or, or as the original work. So, like you will see that there are six creative common licenses: CC by CC by NC, CC by ND, CC by NC, ND. So, like you can, uh, this is just meant to guide you as an author when you are publishing. Uh, a, a, your work with an open access journal and they tell you that this work is uh, protected by, uh, by this kind of creative common licenses. So let's talk about predatory journals. Uh, because of open access, like uh, it has given rise to what is called predatory journals. Uh, predatory journals, these are, an, uh, are journals that accept articles quickly with or little or no peer review. They notify researchers of article processing fees only after papers have been access, uh, accepted. They aggressively campaign for authors to submit articles and save on their editorial boards. They list uh, like researchers as members of their editorial boards, uh, boards and so forth and so forth. So you should like be careful 
when you are publishing to avoid publishing with predatory journals. Like I say, the, like this presentation is going to be shared with everyone. So you get to understand more about predatory journals. And there are a number of resources that you can use that are online to identify if a journal is in uh, a trust with journal or it is a predatory journal. So like some of the examples are like on the board, like uh, the Mayfair Geoth Library, and you also have uh, like the lib guides from uh, one of the universities in Pretoria, which is called Vitz University. And we also have this resource that is called Think, Check and Submit. So Think, Check and Submit, they are, they are asking you like the thing. So it's a three-way process. So you think, are you submitting your research to a trusted journal or a publisher? Is, the right, is it the right journal? or book for your work. And then they've on the check part, they have developed a checklist that you can actually use to assess uh, the journal of, or the publisher. Then if your answers to the checklist is yes, you can go ahead and submit your article with that journal. So because of time, I'm going to end here and I'm going to hand over to Gretchen for the next part of the presentation. Thank you very much. Over to you, Gretchen. You're on mute, Gretchen. Thanks a lot, Miss. Okay. Somebody uh, showing the slides. You want me to share my slides? Okay. Yeah, thank you. So what we are going to do now is we are going to shift gears a little bit and then talk about preparing the manuscript itself so that we can get published, okay? So basically, you should make sure that you have identified the right journal, okay? So that's quite important. But now you've submit, so, so selected the journal now, you wanna make sure that you now match the work that you are going to be doing to that journal and you make sure that you are uh, following the requirements. So the common problems that you will find on a manuscript are issues to do with the grammar, the punctuation, the English to just make sure that everything is correct, okay? Um, you also want to make sure that um, the frameworks that you are using are proper and the actual presentation is properly structured and you do all the proofreading to make sure that the, uh, the message is clear when you are um, sending it out, all right? Um, you also want to make sure that when you write, you write all the ideas, you put them down and then you do the editing later. But what is important is to make sure that keep it simple, um, no big um, vocabulary uh, words are, are, which are necessary um, and also keep to the structure as required. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the IMRAD since that is consistent with a lot of um, uh, disciplines. Um, it doesn't cover all the disciplines um, but make sure that when you do tell your story, it is quite clear and it is structured. Let's go to the next slide. Generally, um, the style and language, when you look at most of these journals, uh, you will go to the author's guide and you'll see that they really talk to that and, and try and make sure that it's clear to you what they would accept. Um, when you are writing your manuscript, some people will start by writing the manuscript and then they look for the journal. Um, but I would recommend that you actually look at a specific journal and then look at the guidelines and, and then take it from there um, when, you, when you are writing the manuscript. Okay, let's move on. I talked about the language, and so that's clear. Let's move on. All right. 
the issues of plagiarism, I think we'll talk about that later. You just want to avoid all that. Um, but if there are issues to do with um, uh, confirming or acknowledging things like confidentiality and information that you are supposed to be keeping within the, that, that targeted journal and what you don't want published, all those kind of things, you must make sure that they are, they are clear. Okay, and then of course the issues of inaccuracy. Do you are you making sure that in terms of especially statistics and things like that, make sure that they are not biased, they are clear, uh, and then you submit your paper. Now let me go and talk about uh, more about the the statistics at a later stage. Let's move on. Let's go to the structure. All right, so that's the general structure that I was talking about, um, the IMRAD. And you will see that there are guidelines that are clear in most of these journals. They will talk about the title, they will talk about the st structure where you put in the authors and of course the abstract. Let's move on. Um, let's focus on the title and the authors. Um, in terms of the title, some journals will even limit um, the number of words, the sentence that you are gonna use there um, how impactful can it be when it is really structured? They, 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 they give you those kind of gui guidelines. Um, look at that. And also, of course, in terms of the authors, of course, um, it's you who is the main author, the corresponding author, and of course, in a descending order in terms of contribution. Um, the abstract, let me spend a bit of time on that because it does tell the story and it gives a map of what is available in the, in the paper. Um, so let's talk a little bit more about the, the abstract. You will see that several abstracts um, are structured. That's kind of the, 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 the trend, if you want to say. Um, they will tell you that these are the sections that we are looking for. Put in the methodology. Uh, you, you tell us what you are focusing on in terms of the findings, the discussion that you have done and highlight the findings. And they sometimes limit even the, the structure and the number of words in, this, in each of those sections. So please make sure that you follow that. Remember about uh, you are focusing on your audience, the type of audience, and therefore you are speaking their language. You, you want to make sure that it's attractive, it is giving you information and it is focusing on what your findings are in terms of your research. Let's move on. I've given the, I know you can't read it right now, but when you do get the slides, look at that uh, quite closely, the three examples that are there. Okay, you will see the structures that I was talking about. You can sometimes have to give a background, the objectives, methodology, results, and conclusion. That's just one example. Um, and they make sure that you, the, you, the weight count is limited. And therefore the information on each of those structures or this of those sections is also limited. Let's move on. So the next section, um, which is quite important in terms of telling your story is of course the introduction. The introduction has got to be clear. And I always say, Go and write your introduction, okay? Don't, don't start with the abstract like I indicated already. Go and write your introduction first and make sure that you capture things like what led to that study. That's key. Um, what does the literature say? Where are we in, that, in terms of that innovation, in terms of that research, in terms of that area that you are focusing on? And what are the gaps that are there? And of course, why is this study important? Once you cover that, and then now you move on to the outcomes, all that um, well, make sure that it is coincise, it is focused, and you cover all that in the first paragraphs that cover the introduction. Then of course, the next section, depending again on your discipline, um, is the materials and methods that you have used um, if it is um, something that is technical, especially the core hard sciences, you are doing agriculture, you are doing um, health sciences, and not, not, not mostly in uh, social sciences, you will see that 
they want you to make sure that you have talked about the materials that you have used and you are very clear if there's equipment, there's software, anything in terms of methodology and things like that is all covered in the materials section. But if it is social sciences, social sciences, you are then focusing on the methodology that you have used. Was it a survey? Um, and what, how big was the survey? What was the sample size and things like that? Those should be clear in this, in this section. Let's move on. Okay, I've talked about that and let's move on. Okay, in terms of the results, all right, make sure that the results are clear and you will see that in this section, usually you have your figures, your tables um, and your charts and all that. So the way you label them also must be clear. So all the data that you are going to be presenting in this section has to follow the rules uh, that are directed by the journal. And in the author's guide, those are made very clear. Also, in terms of the actual um, uh, implications of what you are trying to present in that section in terms of information, make sure that it is clear, it is logical, somebody can follow it um, through. And you, of course, you are not uh, overloading in terms of um, uh, the text that you are putting in that section and also make sure that each of the sentences that you are putting in there talks to what is available in the uh, presentation, be it a figure, be it a table, um, be it a graph. All right, let's move on. The discussion section is quite important. Some of the researchers, after they've looked at your abstract, they will go to the section of your results and look at that then they will move on to the discussion just to make sure that they understand what is going on before reading the entire paper. They will just look at those kind of section in that order. Abstract, they go to the results and then they come to the discussion. That's why it is crucial that the discussion is, is quite clearly written. You are going to discuss the results in here and you're analyzing the, the results. And so therefore it must be clear what your finding um, is adding to the body of knowledge that is already available, and it must be clear in this section of discussion. Let's move on. Okay, everyone will ask at that point, so what? What you have found out, what you have outlined, especially in the conclusion, um, what did you find? What was the structure? What is new in your discussion? And that's quite important. In your conclusion, and again, it doesn't have to be very long, it must always stick to what you, you found out and what are the, the, the discussion saying and you are not adding new information that you are not had in the entire paper. So that's the conclusion. Um, then let's move on. You will have the other sections that normally come and these are pretty standard. The acknowledgements, um, what are the limitations in terms of your, of your study, in terms of your findings, and of course, what are the other contributors and what else is important around the work that you have done? You acknowledge that in this section. Um, let's move on to the next session. And that's the references. Please make sure that you're citing, you are citing well and you are avoiding plagiarism by all means. So anything that is new, anything that is not common knowledge is, is referenced and you are referencing properly. The styles of reference are always clear in the author's guide. Make sure you follow all that. You will have a link here that will detail the referencing in terms of style and what you, you, you found out. So please do have a look at this section when you get the PowerPoint presentations. Let's move on. I'd like to just conclude this section by saying once you have submitted your manuscript, um, you listen out. Obviously, you are waiting for a great result. Whatever the outcome comes, which comes out of your submission, look at um, what they say. If it is an outcome that says you are accepted, great. But it is an outcome that actually says that you need to go back and um, work on some sections, correct things, or add more information. Look at that. Have those kinds of discussions with your uh, your your colleagues. If there is an opportunity for you to present that kind of work in a conference and or preprints kind of a server, 
and things like that, take the advantage and do that so that you can actually get more feedback and more conversation about your work before you resubmit or before you address the issues that have been raised. It's a feedback, feedback session that is quite important. Um, sometimes um, colleagues do ignore that and they really just are focusing on what the editors have said. But you do get a lot of information from your colleagues once they've read, read the paper or if you do a presentation in a type of a conference or a workshop. So let's move on. Okay, I will then leave this uh, section uh, to my colleague, uh, Victoria. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Christian. So I will share my screen here. see that yes we can see your screen great all right so now we're going to move on and we're going to talk about the different elements that you need to take into consideration when getting ready to submit your paper for peer review so first of all when preparing to submit your paper to a journal your first stop should be the journal's instructions for authors or the author guidelines which mercy mentioned at the beginning of her um, section Every journal will have what we call instructions for authors, and these are essentially the rule books for the journal. So under the instructions for authors, you're going to find a lot of information. Um, you'll find information on APCs and waivers for open access, but you'll also find information on any other fees the journal might have. For instance, like uh, economics journals, they tend to have submission fees. Often some agricultural journals might have page fees, that sort of thing. All that information will be listed there. There'll be information about the peer review process for that particular journal and what that entails. They'll have the types of articles they accept and the word limits for those articles. There also might be reporting guidelines, especially for medical titles. And then there'll be information about how you should prepare formatting, if that's relevant, um, headings, reference style, um, the type of English um, they'd like you to use. Some journals prefer British English, others American English. There will also be information about data sharing policies and any other relevant information, such as similarity checks that are conducted upon submission. So again, you want to take a look at those instructions for authors. And I recommend perhaps creating a bit of a checklist of things that you need to do before you submit based on those instructions, just to help you um, move through that process in a structured way. Now, many articles will include visuals, whether that is data representations in the form of charts and tables and figures, or perhaps other visuals such as photographs or maps. So before submitting, check the journal guidelines on image resolution and the other formatting requirements they might have for their visuals. And remember to create separate, clearly labeled files for your visuals. They shouldn't be embedded in the manuscript that you submit. They should be their own separate file. That being said, you want to make sure that your visuals um, and the in-text references and labels match. And in terms of your in-text references, they should fully describe the visual image and what it represents. The visual image and caption should be able to stand alone. People should be able to look at that in the caption below and understand exactly what they're looking at. Obtaining permission to use images and data is your responsibility. So make sure to include a reference in your paper for instance, you can have something like this image courtesy of, and then include the copyright reference. And also, if you're using a photo you or someone else took of another person, and that person is identifiable in the photo, you must obtain permission from them to publish the photo. If you don't have that permission, the publisher will likely remove it from the article. Increasingly, journals are requesting that data be submitted or at least made available upon submission of the article. And there are many types of data out there. 
Um, so there's notes and lab notebooks and sketches, methodologies, protocols, various types of media, whether that's photographs or video, music, audio files, maps, models, al algorithms, interviews, transcripts, software code, et cetera. Basically anything that you've used to come to the results of your um, research findings. And journals will have different policies around sharing data. So again, it's important to re review those instructions for authors to see if you'll be required to share the data and in what manner. At the most basic, data should be placed in a public repository and linked, um, linked to that repository in your article. And when we talk about data being open, we mean that they should be accessible to the public. The objective is increasing the transparency and reproducibility of the research. And the best practice is to follow the FAIR principles, which I believe was discussed in an earlier webinar on open research. And this means that the data should be findable. It should be assigned a globally unique persistent identifier, such as a DOI. It should be accessible. So everyone should have free access to the data via a well-defined protocol. It should be interoperable. That is, the data should be structured in line with common practices and principles using standard vocabularies and classifications so that people can actually work with it. And lastly, it should be reusable. That means it should have clear and accessible data usage license. And then lastly, if you're concerned about sharing, sharing data, which many people do, um, basically you will need to decide if your data shouldn't be shared for any reason, such as if you have sensitive data where the subject can be identified. The rule is open as possible, closed as necessary. Depending on the type of research you've conducted, there may be a number of documents that might be required upon submission. And for those of you that joined us last week, Sabina has, and Hasib covered some of this. But I thought I would highlight it once again um, as lack of documentation during submission process can cause delays. So if you've been doing research that involves human beings and communities, then you'll um, have to show that you have obtained ethical approval. And many universities have divisions that grant ethics approvals for research. However, if you were unable to obtain ethics approval for some reason, for instance, if you don't have that kind of an entity um, at your institution, you need to explain why that approval is missing. Consent from participants in a study is also required. This would be more relevant for medical or ethnographic or participatory research. And as mentioned, you'll need to get permission for data and images that are not your own and that you need to do prior to submission. You also you also always want to state if there is a conflict of interest. It could be that you have received consulting fees or research funding from a corporation. Um, maybe you've been employed by a business that is included in your research, or you might have investments in a company that might be affected by that publication of the paper. Um, it doesn't have to be a monetary conflict of interest, but those are just some examples. And lastly, it's essential that you obtain consent to publish if any human can be identified in your paper. As I mentioned, that could be via photograph, but it also could be a description of their circumstance. Say if you're doing a medical case study that's very particular um, and the people might be able to be identified. Again, Sabina covered that last week in the ethics talk. And as publishing has moved online, Cover letters are not always required. However, some journals do still ask for them. And even if they don't, it is a great opportunity for you to make a case for publishing your paper. And there are a few pieces of information that should always be included in a cover letter. First of all, you wanna address the letter to the editor. And if you don't know their name, just go on the journal website. It will always have the editor's name listed there. However, you should, um, oh, excuse me. Um, you also wanna introduce uh, your paper by including the title early on. So let the editor know that you have not submitted the paper to another journal. 
and at the same, you know, at the same time, and that it hasn't been published before. Now, the exception to that is if you are hoping to publish a translation, then you would want to include that information in your cover letter as well, just letting them know that a translation had been published before, have the full citation to that so they can see that translation and ask them if they would be interested in publishing it. Next, you want to briefly describe the paper and the contribution it's making, why they should publish it, basically. And you don't want to copy and paste your abstract. This text really should be emphasizing the significance of the research. However, I should say, you don't want to overstate the significance because that will just end up by irritating the editor in the end. So be honest with yourself and just be frank about what kind of contribution the research is making. You should also declare any conflicts of interest in the cover letter, or if there are none, you can state that as well. And lastly, provide all of the contact information um, your contact information and that of your co-authors if you have co-authors. And if you do have co-authors, you want to identify who will be the corresponding author. A couple things to avoid with cover letters. First of all, you don't want to have too much detail. Cover letters really should just be one page. So keep it simple. Um, don't put too much in there. And then in terms of language, you really want to avoid jargon and acronyms, because if you're using jargon, you need to explain the jargon. If you're using an acronym, you'd need to unpack that acronym. And again, that takes up a lot of space. That's just too much detail for a cover letter. And lastly, take the time to go over and check your spelling and grammar and make sure that the letter reads really well, because this is your first impression. This is the first thing that the editor will see. So you want to make sure that it reads really well. A few last things to keep in mind when you're getting ready to submit. Um, first of all, in the instructions for authors, you'll find information about the submission process for that journal and the type of system that they use for peer review. For most journals, they're going to be using an online submission system. And most publishers have guidance materials for the different systems that they use. So it's a good idea that you review those beforehand before you submit your paper so that you know what to expect and the different materials that you need to have and nothing comes as a surprise during that process. And then prior to submission, you wanna make sure that you have all the necessary files ready. And again, remember all of your visuals, tables, and other data files need to be submitted separately rather than embedded in the manuscript. So if you do have visuals, you're probably going to be submitting a number of documents into that system. And again, one last pitch, make sure that you've obtained permission to use all those images and data in your paper. And again, that needs to be done before submission because that just delays the process, the production process. Um, the production team will come back to you and ask for that permission. If you have co-authors, it's a good idea to have a written agreement on the roles and responsibilities of everyone and which journal you're planning on submitting to. For those of you that joined uh, the session last week, you'll remember Sabina and Hasid discussing the problems that can arise around authorship disputes. So it's just best that you have that agreement at the start of the process. And also you wanna make sure to include the preferred spelling of your co-authors names, as well as the relevant email address and affiliation if that's relevant. And then lastly, I know this sounds silly, but you wanna make sure to submit the correct version of your paper. A lot of times people submit the paper and they wait for four months for the peer review process to be completed. And then they get a rejection notice they open up the file and realize that they sent the wrong version of their paper. So take that extra five to 10 minutes to check all your files to make sure that they're the most up-to-date files before you submit. Right, okay, we're gonna go um, on to the peer review process, but first I would like to go back to Mentimeter quickly. Let's see if I can do this without making too much of a mess. And I would like to hear from you what your thoughts are on what the purpose of peer review is. Why is peer review important? Okay, and maybe just when I give the instructions to go to Mentimeter again for those who joined later. Yeah, you'll see the you'll see the on the top of the screen there the address, and then the code that you need to put in when you come to that website. So 
documents about improving papers, evaluation, contrib contribution, that's great. Data accuracy, quality, third eye, yeah. <laughs> These wordles always move around too quick for me to <laughs> keep up. Looks like contributions had a couple votes there in quality, methodological rigor. Suggestions. I did sign conspiracies, yeah. Validation tools. Excellent. Visual methods. Fantastic. Right, great. I think we'll go back to the main presentation now. It looks like quality is winning out here. <laughs> Great. Wonderful. Hey, thanks. We can share these afterwards with people if that would be of interest. All right, so let's go back to the presentation here. Right, so this quote really captures the importance of peer review for me. Not only is it quality control, but it's also a form of collaboration between researchers. And researchers agree that peer review is an essential part of the process. So the chart on this slide is from now a fairly old study from 2018, but this was a massive study conducted by Publons about peer review, where you can see that the peer review either important or extremely important. Peer review is where papers are assessed for the different elements that have been discussed um, today. Is the article a good fit? Does it follow our guidelines? Is the research novel in making a contribution to the field? Is it sound science? Does the evidence support the findings? Is it contributing to the body of literature? Is it well-written? Does the author clearly communicate their findings? And are there any ethical issues? But before we explore peer review further, I'd just like to address the question of bias in peer review and publication, as we tend to receive questions about this now and again. And if you were to ask any of the editors that we work with um, if there's bias in their peer review process, most, if not all, would strongly say no and state that they're only interested in the science and the quality of the article and that they really keep an eye out for any kind of bias. So intentional bias should not be assumed. And listen, this is a big topic and we could easily spend a whole session on it, but I thought I'd briefly discuss two types of bias associated with publishing and how editors and publishers are trying to address them. The first is publication bias, which is when an editorial decision about publication is based on the outcomes of the research. So some journals are interested in only publishing work that has significant findings or positive results. So research with null or negative results tends to be rejected in those journals. However, many publishers and societies are changing the scopes of their journals or launching new journals and platforms that focus on sound science. And what we mean by this is science that was expertly conducted and is sound, but perhaps doesn't have a significant or novel results or maybe negative results. And we see this, especially with many open access journals and platforms that are out there. Now there are other open uh, research practices designed to open up the research process and try and create greater transparency and reproducibility and eliminate bias. And we had that session earlier in the um, series on open research, which would have covered some of those practices. Now the second type of bias is often called editorial bias, which is when factors related to the author or their environment influences editorial decisions. So this can mean bias based on gender, geography, institutions, et cetera. And this can be difficult to measure and assert with 100% confidence. However, it is safe to say that there is a certain preference for how research is presented, both in terms of language and the communication of research which relates to where people are based in the world and their experiences and their access to resources. So English is the preferred language currently, specifically American and British English. And there is an expectation that research findings will be communicated in a certain style that's based on Anglo-European traditions. However, 
Editorial boards and publishers are really trying to tackle questions of diversity and inclusion in authorship by diversifying their editorial boards to ensure that they include both editors and peer reviewers from across regions. So it's early days, but we are seeing a strong commitment to a more inclusive publishing landscape, including how people are communicating their research findings. So let's take a look at what peer review looks like in practice. There are three types of peer review you're likely to come across. And the first is called single anonymous or single blind. And this is when peer, the peer reviewer knows the identity of the author, but the author doesn't know the identity of the peer reviewer. And this tends to be the most common type of peer review within science, uh, technology, and medical fields. And the second type of peer review is double anonymous, or sometimes called double blind peer review. And this is where all the identities are hidden. This tends to be the most common type within arts and humanities and social sciences. Um, if it is double blind peer review that you're going to be engaging with, it's important that you anonymize your paper. So you wanna remove any references to your name, previous publications, or any other information that could identify you in the manuscript that you submit. And then lastly, there's open peer review where all the identities are known. But keep in mind, there are many varieties of open peer review from the basic where everyone knows who each other is to a completely open process where the public can see the submitted version of the article and all the peer reviewers and authors comments and the different versions of the paper. So make sure to again, review those instructions for authors before submitting so that you're aware of the type of open peer review the journal conducts. And here's an overview of how peer review works in most cases. So you'll submit your manuscript to the journal and it will go through an initial check to see if everything's in order. And if it's not formatted correctly, or if it's missing files or other components, it will be returned to you with instructions on what to do. And then once the files are in order, the submission is then sent to the editor for a quick review. And the editor will decide if the paper should be sent out to peer review. At this stage, it can be rejected um, if it's out of scope of the journal or if it's difficult to read or understand. And this is called a desk reject. Now, if the paper is of interest, the editor will send it out to peer review, usually to two or more external reviewers who are specialists in that area. And they will read the work and provide a report to the, uh, to the editor with recommendations for a decision. The editor will then make a decision and send you the reports with that decision. And if you have received a revise and resubmit, you will need to make the revisions and then resubmit your manuscript to the editor, who will either accept it at that point, or they may send it out again to the reviewers to see if they're happy or if they have further comments. Now, here's the bad news. Your paper can go through that process a couple of times and still be rejected, but I'll tell you how to avoid that in just a moment. So peer reviewer reports can vary from extremely brief, one paragraph, to more detailed. Um, it often depends upon the person writing it or the journal requirements, or in some cases, the practices in different disciplines. However, there is a general structure that is common across most disciplines. First of all, you will definitely receive a brief note from the editor. And this note will provide deadlines for when you need to return your revisions and may include some guidelines on how to respond to peer reviewers comments. So for example, if peer reviewers have different opinions about a certain aspect of your paper, the editor may suggest you follow one of the reviewers suggestions over the other. In terms of the report, the reviewers will assess every aspect of your paper. Most of the re reviewers have been asked to review the work because they um, are doing research in the same area. So they will have the expertise to evaluate your work. Sometimes if, for example, you're using unusual methods, the editor might invite a specialist in that type of methodology to review just that aspect of your paper. The same is true you know, in general with some um, journals have statistical reviewers. Now the actual report will likely be divided into three sections. So first, there will be an overview of the article, summarizing the key points and contributions. 
So basically the reviewer playing back to you how they understand your paper. The report will then focus on the major comments, those areas of the paper that must be addressed, whether that is adding material or amending or restructuring or removing sections. Whatever the recommendation, it absolutely needs to be addressed in your paper or in your response to the editor. And then the final section will uh, likely cover minor comments. And these tend to be recommendations for just small changes, nothing that would significantly alter the article, but might improve it somewhat. So from the editor, you will receive um, a decision on your paper regarding publication. And the first on this title is accept. And while it's possible that your paper will be accepted without revisions, it's highly unlikely. Most papers benefit from revisions, whether they involve minor or major changes. The next type of decision is reject. And there are two different types of reject. So I mentioned desk reject, and that is when your paper is rejected without being sent out to external reviewers. And the papers are rejected at this stage more often than not because they don't fit the aims and scope of the paper. And also the other reasons could be that they're poorly written or they're difficult to understand. The decision for desk reject usually comes fairly quickly, usually within one or two weeks, um, because again, it's just the editor looking at a paper and saying that nah, this isn't for our journal. And it does tend to be the most common decision. Now reject after peer review can be due to many factors. So contribution to the subject, poor communication of the research, problematic methods, a weak literature review, or weak discussion. It could be any number of things. Now, apart from desk reject, the most common decisions authors receive are revise and resubmit with either major revisions or minor revisions. So if you receive one of these decisions, you really should celebrate because this means the peer reviewers and the editors are interested in your work. Um, they just think that there's other things that need to be done to the work. Now, with revise and resubmit with major revisions, that means that you still have a lot of work to do before the paper can be accepted. However, there is something in your paper that the peer reviewers like and would like to see you develop further. So it could be your thesis, it could be the case studies you're working with, um, your engagement with particular theories or the methods you're using. It could be any number of things. But you will need to make some major changes to the paper, and it's definitely not guaranteed that your paper will be accepted in the end. Revise and resubmit with minor changes usually means that there are a few small changes you need to make before the paper is accepted. And some call this provisional acceptance because in most cases, if you make those changes, your paper will be published in the end. Right, so one of the most important parts of the publishing process is uh, responding to the reviewer's comments. Um, it's really, really important. And it's a, the stage of the process that you should take incredibly seriously. First of all, you want to carefully read the decision letter because it might include advice on how to respond to the reviewer's comments and will pro provide information about deadlines for returning your revisions, as I mentioned. And at times when you receive the reviewer reports, it can feel like a rejection, especially those revise and resubmit with major revisions. Try not to become upset, but if you do become upset, close your computer, go into your kitchen, make yourself a cup of tea and forget about it for a couple of days. And then when you're ready to get back to work, um, set up a meeting with your co-authors if you have them and send them the comments and so that they have those ahead of time um, so you can have a productive meeting. But even if you don't have co-authors, you need to go through those reviewer reports and make a list of all of their suggestions for improvement. And you may want to group the comments based on categories, so literature review, method section, whatever works for you, but you want to have a thorough list that absolutely captures each one of the points that they've made. And then you want to go through that list and decide which recommendations you'd like to adopt and make those changes. Now here's the key to avoiding the fate of going through the revisions process a couple of times and still being rejected. When you send back your revisions, you must include a note to the editor clearly detailing how you've addressed each one of the peer reviewers concerns. So where you've adopted the peer reviewers recommendations, 
clearly detail what you've changed and where that change can be located in the paper. So again, be very specific, you know, page number, line number, you can use a highlighter. Some journals welcome the use of track changes to help editors and peer reviewers see what you've done, but you still need that cover letter explaining what you've done. Now, you will not agree with all of the peer reviewers' recommendations. That's absolutely normal. But in that case, you need to clearly and respectfully explain why you chose not to amend your paper. So again, be specific here. So for instance, if a peer reviewer thought you should cite another paper, but you feel it's outside of the scope of your project, explain why that is so that both the peer reviewer and the editor understand your logic. Now, once you've detailed how you've addressed each of the peer reviewer's comments, review your response to the editor and make sure that you've included all of the recommendations and actions that you've taken that you've done so in a clear manner and that the letter is professional and devoid of any frustration. This can be an incredibly challenging process, so it's absolutely understandable that you may become a bit frustrated. It's just important that that doesn't influence the communication you have with the editor. And most importantly, remember to be respectful and professional during this process. This is your community, your future network. You may end up submitting to the journal again. You may be asked to peer review articles. You may want to become a board member one day, or you may have dreams of collaborating with the people that are currently reviewing your paper. So keep all of this in mind during the process. And remember, the editor and the peer reviewers are just trying to help you publish the very best version of your work. So try not to take the feedback you receive on your article personally. It's about the research. So that's it for me, but I wanted to um, address some of the questions that we received ahead of time um, before we move into the wider Q&A. So we received four questions that were related to peer review that I thought I would just briefly discuss. So the first one is, what do reviewers really look for? And I mentioned that at the beginning of the peer reviewer section, but some of the things I thought I'd highlight here is, they're asking themselves, is it clear what the authors want to communicate and the direction of the manuscript? They also want to know what contribution the article is making to the field and to the study. They'll be looking to see that the manuscript is original, and they're going to be looking to see if the overall study design and approach is appropriate for that particular um, article. They're also going to be concerned about language. Um, again, it's about how you're communicating. And, and if the language is too difficult to understand, that's going to play a factor in their decision. Now, you can find guidance on um, a lot of guidance for peer reviewers on many publishers sites. And oftentimes, they have checklists that kind of highlight each area that the peer reviewers are meant to look at. So that can be a great guide for you as an author as well. So you can check out the different publishers sites to see what you can find there. Now, the second question had to do with um, appealing a rejection decision. And publishers welcome genuine appeals to editor decisions. However, you need to provide strong evidence or new data or information in response to the editors and reviewers comments. Appeals do tend to be quite unusual and editors very rarely reverse a decision. So really at the end of the day, your best move is just to move on and submit to another journal. However, if you do feel that you have a strong case, you will need to submit a letter to the editor and you'll need to explain why you disagree with the decision and you need to provide specific responses to the reviewer and editor's comments that led to that rejection decision. So again, you'll provide any relevant new material that they should consider. You want to provide evidence if you believe the reviewer made a technical mistake in their assessment. So if they're not understanding something really basic. And you need to include evidence if you believe the reviewer has a conflict of interest. You can't just claim that the reviewer has a conflict of interest. You really need to show um, with peer evidence why that is. So again, um, your best strategy probably is to move on to the next journal, but if you do feel that you have a case that you need to, um, to pursue, that would be the uh, direction you'd wanna take. 
Now, the other question, and it is the most popular question I've ever received in, in all my years of doing author talks, is how long does peer review take? And as you see there, the average response time, it depends. It depends on a lot of different factors. Um, different disciplines will have longer or shorter averages. For instance, in the arts and humanities, where articles tend to be text heavy, editors hope to have the first decision back to authors maybe within three months. Um, but that likely would be much quicker in STM fields. And there are many things that can delay peer review. It can be difficult sometimes to find peer reviewers, especially if the research is rather niche. So many editors have to send out 10 plus invites to find two reviewers. I've heard some editors say that they had to send out 30 invites. So it can take some time to find a peer reviewer. And then even after they found a peer reviewer, they depend on the peer reviewer to return the report by the deadline they've been given. So um, obviously many peer reviewers often miss the deadlines and then the editors need to chase them for the reports. Um, also, if a journal sees a sudden increase in submissions, their peer review process will be impacted. So, you know, if a journal is growing really quickly, maybe it got, you know, a really high impact factor one year and suddenly they're just being, you know, uh, drowning in submissions, that's going to really affect the times on their, um, uh, the turnaround times for peer review. And of course, we saw quite a few delays associated with the pandemic. So as I said, it depends on many different factors. What I would say is be as patient as you can, but if you haven't heard anything back from the journal after say four or five months, you can just send a polite note to the editor saying, hey, can I get an update on you know, uh, the peer review process, the status of my paper? Um, again, be really polite because the editors are under a lot of stress trying to make the system work as well. And then the last question we had was, how can one become a peer reviewer? Great question. Um, first of all, most journals are looking for people who have some experience, um, um, have some expertise in a subject area and have published at least one time. And if that is you, you can write a note to, to an editor of a journal that you think is a good fit for you um, and show your interest in peer reviewing for that journal. You wanna make sure to list your areas of expertise. Sometimes you can even attach a CV or a link to your professional page if you have one. And then lastly, there are many different peer review training workshops that you can participate in. Um, we have some resources on the Research for Life uh, resource site, but you can also just check out different uh, publishers' websites. And also if you are a member of a scholarly society, they might also have peer reviewer training. So that is it for me. I will stop sharing. Thanks a lot, Victoria. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Victoria. We have other questions in the question and answer. Like we try to answer the other questions, but like I think some, <laughs> uh, you are the best person to answer. Okay. Yes. So the first question from Alberto is saying, what is the period for the publication of an article? For an example, an article of 2016, but for several reasons could not publish at that time, can it still be submitted in 2022? Yeah, I mean, I would say, you know, some some research is time sensitive, you know, the, the field moves on and, and maybe there wouldn't be as much interest in um, that subject. But for a lot of fields, it, as long as the, the research would still be of interest to that community, then there's no reason why you couldn't um, submit. You might want to look, you know, look at that article again. You might want to update references, make sure that you know you're you're engaging with the most recent discussions in that area, that your data is up to date, and that sort of thing. Um, but if in doubt, you can always write a note to the editor and you know explain the situation, send an abstract, and see you know if that they would be interested in publishing that article. They might not respond, especially if it's a really busy journal. They might be too busy, but um, you can always try. Okay, thank you for that. 
Uh, Rubel is asking, how can I get journals in my area of discipline? I think I covered that in the in the first part of the presentation. So when we share the presentation, you can refer to those resources. Uh, like, uh, and you can also find that, uh, like I indicated before, different journals, they've got uh, services or tools that you can use to find journals that are being published by them. Yeah. To, so you need to add the title, like most services, they ask you to add the title of your article and the abstract, then they will give you the list of journals that you can publish with the APC charge, the rejection rates, and so forth and so yeah. forth. So you I can should, refer to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should say with those, those systems where you cut and paste your abstract in, you need to still go and look at the aims and scopes of those journals and such, because they're basically taking the language you've used in your abstract and trying to match you to a journal. And it's not always gonna be a perfect fit. So it, you still need to do that due diligence of reading the aims and scope and that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. So Stanley is asking, what are the advantages of being a reviewer? Is it not time consuming? Yeah, yeah, it's time consuming. There's no way around that. But you know, a lot of people um, feel that peer review is um, an obligation to their community. There, there's a lot of reasons. Number one, it helps you keep up to date with the most recent research because you know you're going to be reading a lot of stuff that's coming through. It. Um, you know, it, it, it uh, is a way of becoming a member of a community. Um, a lot of times when journals are building their editorial boards to say, hey, this person's been um, doing a lot of peer reviewing for us. Why don't we talk to them to see if they wanna join the editorial board? Um, so there's a lot of different benefits um, to being a peer reviewer. Um, but I would say those are the two that I hear most from people that they feel like those are two ways of, you know, becoming a part of this community and also keeping on top of the research that's out there. Yeah, and I also know that ORCID, they are now recognizing peer reviewers. So if you have got an ORCID profile, exactly. uh, then you can actually add the, if you have done some peer reviews before, you can actually add those papers on your profile. So. Mm -hmm that uh, that's making your profile more, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and I think more institutions are, I mean, I, don't, I think institutions didn't used to take peer review into account when they're doing annual assessments, but there, there are moves in different countries to kind of push in that direction. I, I was on a panel a few years ago and I remember um, there was somebody in Denmark saying, yeah, that's something that some of the institutions in Denmark are starting to look at when they're doing their annual assessments of faculty, you know, how many times to be peer reviewed and that sort of thing. So I think you're right, Mercy, a lot of different ways that people are starting to value it. Um, okay, thank professionally. you. Professionally. Mm -hmm. So Hafiz is asking about plagiarism. How do I avoid plagiarism? There are a lot of sources that you can consult on avoiding plagiarism. Mm -hmm. Like you need to paraphrase and stuff. And most institutions, they develop like guidelines or tutorial later that they sent you on how to avoid plagiarism. Uh, but uh, like uh, on the research for life training materials for the MOOCs, I think if you, or the materials that are available on the website, if you revisit them, you can actually find some important information on how to avoid plagiarism in, in some of the sessions. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay, as is to reduce response time, what do, what do publishing industry do? Is there a plan to provide royalties for reviewers? Oh, yeah, that's a question that comes around a lot. And there's a lot of, there's a lot of discussion about that. I, I think in general, um, there hasn't been any big moves in terms of paying reviewers. There's been a lot of studies that have gone out and people ask what kind of compensation would they like for peer review? And actually being paid ends up at the bottom of the list there, um, which is was surprising to me, but most peer reviewers want that recognition and that sort of thing. So what, what, publishers tend to do um, is we try and work with our systems to make sure that the systems are moving really quickly, to make sure that the communication between editors and peer reviewers and authors is really fluid, kind of fluid, making sure that those return times are quick, 
um, as I said, part of the pro problem with peer review is that there can be this delay. So making sure that um, you know the peer reviewers are getting those kind of reminders at the right times. So it's really what publishers do is you know work behind the scenes with those systems and work with our editors and editorial boards just to talk about best practice with peer review to, in terms of efficiency. So that's the kind of work that we do on our end. Okay, thank you. Robert is asking, I want more enlightenment on sharing research data. Where do we share it from? And how do we cite this data in, manus in the manuscripts? Yeah, so I think in the open um, research session, there probably was a lot of information about um, data. So I would encourage you to look at that session again, but there is, tons of resources out there. In terms of how to share da data, it will be different um, with the different journals that you submit to, but a great way to do it is to put it in a repository. And there are oodles of repositories out there. Um, and basically um, there's a repository for every different subject area, but there are, are also some general deposit repositories. So um, what you would wanna do is cite where that's located in the repository in your paper. But as I said, you, you might want to just take a look at the um, open research uh, session that we did earlier in this series for more information there. Okay, thank you. Danica is asking, are there any instances that a manuscript gets accepted even without ethical approval? Will it be possible to publish an assessment involving interviews and surveys with patients, healthcare workers, for instance, but without ethical approval? It would be tough. It would be very <laughs> tough. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, when you're starting to deal with patients, when you're starting to deal with human subjects, it's, you know, people are looking for ethical approval. And I know it's difficult because I know for some institutions, there's just not that infrastructure, as I mentioned. So you need to figure out a way to get that ethical approval. Um, yeah, but it would be highly unlikely if you're dealing with uh, human subjects. Yeah. Okay, Aziz, don't you think that the extensive checklist of journal requirements discuss, discourage junior researchers to consider the journal for publication? You mean for submitting? Well, yeah, what I, what I would suggest, um, because the requirements, yes, there are a lot of steps that you need to go through, but what I usually um, suggest to people is to look at those instructions for authors. If you know what journal you're going to submit to, look at them before you start writing, because then you know exactly what you're dealing with. You know the kinds of requirements you have. You know the way your paper needs to be formatted and all that kind of stuff. So if you look at that ahead of time, then it makes the whole process a little bit smoother. But yeah, I, I do understand that there are a lot of different hoops you need to um, jump through, but the, I don't think that they're too overwhelming. It's it's some basic stuff that you probably will find you've already covered um, in the writing process. It's just making sure that you have the right documentation um, and and that sort of stuff. Yeah, we have one minute left and we still have some questions. We, okay, we have so final we, slides yeah. too. Yes. So I don't know, should I stop with the questions and move to the final slides? Possibly, because we can maybe um, pick up those questions in the next session if we have time. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, and uh, oh, let me just respond, uh, respond to Diana. She's asking, sometimes you write an email to the authors to use their diagrams and the emails go unanswered. How do you deal with this? Is it enough to just reference their works or how do you demonstrate that you sought permission to use the diagrams? Yeah, so basically when it comes to permissions, this is tricky. Um, I had a case a few years ago with a journal. It was a tourism journal and the author was using a map of Amsterdam from, I think it was 1972 in the document and in their article. And they tried to get permission to use this and the publisher was out of business. They tried to you know, find the cartographer yeah. and everything. I mean, they did everything. And what we said to them is document every single step everything everything you've done we need a you know basically a paper trail of all of your efforts um and that's what i would say with any permissions case you need to make every possible effort to get permission for something that you're using um and and document that um 
And then when you submit it, you can show that documentation. Now, certain types of data, it is a little bit trickier, um, but uh, yeah, it's just about really making every best effort. Okay, all right, thank you. We are at half past now, and I think we need to go through the last presentations before we can close. Sorry for the other four questions that we didn't manage to respond to. We'll pick them up in the next session. Like I indicated before, our next session is going to be on the 20th. Let me try to share my screen again so I can go through the last sessions. Okay. Okay. All right. So like we indicated before, we have got, uh, if you want to train uh, other users in your institution about Research for Life, we have got uh, like uh, training resources on the Research for Life website. So if you go on the Research for Life website under training, you can actually find training materials from Research for Life and also free training resources from our partners like the likes of Taylor and Francis and so forth and so forth. So we encourage you to use those materials. We also have the Librarians Hub and the Author Hub with training materials for the, those different types of audiences. And we have got the webinar recordings as well. So uh, my colleague, Marcia, has uh, pasted uh, the post webinar survey in the chat box. So we encourage you to complete that survey so that we can know what we need to improve in future webinars. And like I indicated uh, at the beginning of this uh, webinar, all webinar, uh, recordings are available, are made available on the Research for Life website. So you can uh, actually visit that uh, page to uh, for the recordings. So I think uh, that's it. Thank you very much. This brings us to the end of our session. Thank you to our participants, uh, our partners, and to the facilitators. Thank you. I don't know if any of the facilitators want to say something? Okay, all right. So thank you very much, everyone. We look forward to seeing you on the next webinar that is on the 20th of July. This is, this is going to be the last part of this webinar series. Bye for now. Thank you.